This is the 2.5, Conversations Connecting Innovators. My name is Klaus. I'm an innovation coach in the southwest of Germany. The goal of this podcast is helping other innovators to grow through meaningful conversations. Today's guest is productivity coach Karl Pulin. In this episode, Karl and I are talking about an easy and agile way to do your yearly planning as an innovator. We are also talking about embedding that into a mid-term target and a long-term vision and using some simple tools to get these things done. I'm really looking forward to this conversation. This is Carl Pauline. Hello, Carl. Welcome back to the podcast. Well, thank you very much for inviting me back and Happy New Year to you. Happy New Year to you too. It's uh, 2021. Uh, for everybody who is listening to this show in a later uh, year, um, we are in the middle of something really big, something really special nobody has ever experienced uh, before, only people in the medieval times. Um, Carl, we wanted to talk about planning your year for with a focus on innovators and creators. Um, but before we jump into that, I'd like to talk about your new approach. So my new approach really is to managing time. And it's a system I call the time sector system. And it came about because I've always in the past, I followed GTD. Actually, from 2009, I started following GTD when I moved to the digital format. Prior to that, I was a Franklin Planner user. But the GTD context, uh, for those of you familiar with GTD, Getting Things Done by David Allen, uh, you create lists around context. Context could be places like a place, a person, or a tool. So it could be at office, at home, at um, the hardware store. It could be a tool. So it could be at computer, at phone, that sort of thing, or a person. So it could be at wife, uh, at boss, and so on. And those worked absolutely fantastic when the book came out way back in 2001. And because if we needed to do email, we had to be at a computer. If we needed to do something related to work, we had to be in our office for the most part. But technology has changed over the last, certainly over the last 10 years. And now basically what you can do on your cell phone is things that you could only do on a computer 10, 20 years ago. So I found context no longer worked for me. So I was creating my task list manager by project and projects were just becoming overwhelming. And that's where I found a lot of tasks kind of just went to die and I would never see them again. And I just had a complete rethink. This is way back in 2019 now. I had a real big think about, well, how is this working? And I realized that actually... All I needed to know is what needed to happen this week. That's it. Because I was planning for a week. And all I needed to know is what would I, what did I want to get accomplished this week? What, what were the projects? How was I going to move them forward? How was I going to develop my goals this week? Because I didn't want to be worrying about next week or next month. That's, that will happen on its own. But uh, so I just came up with this thing. Like, well, wait a minute. Let's try this. Let's do it. Let's create folders around this week, next week this month, next month, and then long-term. And that's essentially where it came from. So my new system now, my task manager does not manage my projects. That Task managers are task managers, not project managers. My projects are all managed in my notes. And in a way, I suppose I've gone backwards because this is how we used to do it with Franklin Planners. <laughs> your projects were at the back of the planner. Your tasks were in the day view. So in your day view, you had your tasks for the day, but the projects themselves were managed in a completely different section. And that's essentially what I've done now. My projects are managed in my notes app and it's wonderful because my notes app is a playground. I can dump images, copies of emails. I can dump YouTube video links, resource materials, PDFs. I can create checklists. You, you can do anything in a notes app. A lot of the stuff that you cannot do in a task manager. Mm -hmm. And that's essentially what the whole time sector system is about is your task manager tells you what tasks you need to do today, tomorrow, this week, next week, whatever. And you're managing your projects, you're developing your projects, you're adding the, if you like, the project support materials to use the getting things done terminology in a single notes app. And 
it's just been game changing for me because everything has just speeded up and you know, daily planning takes five, 10 minutes. Weekly planning takes about 20 minutes. You know, before I did this, it was taking about 30 minutes to do a daily plan. It was taking sometimes two hours to do a weekly review. And I, I don't have time for that. I have much more important things to be doing. <laughs> and so it's been a, a real game changer for me. And, and really, it's just dramatically improved my productivity and what I get done each day. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I see what you mean. That was a big overview. <laughs> it <laughs> was, was a big overview. great <laughs> overview because I think it... It is a very, very simple and straightforward approach, and you really wonder why nobody else has come up with it. And uh, and it's I, I when I saw it at first, I was really blown away, and it really helped me a lot to also rethink the way I'm I'm uh, tackling my my uh, projects uh, because it's not about managing the project or tasks and and working with that all the time. It's about doing things and getting things done in the end. It is, it is. And tasks is a task. A project is a project. And they are very different things. Yep. And so they require a different type of focus. And, you know, if you're trying to do it all in one place, it just becomes so overwhelming. Mm -hmm. Plus, if you have everything in your notes app, you will be able to use that in a, at a later time. It's not lost. It's retrievable via search. There is so much oh, knowledge uh, connected to that. So if I'm doing, if I'm going on it, like my wife and I have this, <laughs> this is a post pandemic plan. Um, but what we really want to do is we have this crazy idea of buying an old Land Rover Defender Discovery or Range Rover in your, in Northern France, and then driving it down to the Southern point of Italy, going via Switzerland and then selling the car again. So we buy a used one and then we drive it down to the, but just have a real good two week vacation and then sell it again somewhere in Italy <laughs> or, or wherever. And it's just a crazy idea. But if we do this and then we do something similar in Africa in say five or 10 years mm -hmm. time, I've got all my reference notes in one place because I won't delete that project from my notes app. But if I manage that in my task manager, as soon as I check off a task, it disappears. It yes. goes to archive. And after a while, it just is gone forever. But I have all my notes, all my resource materials that I can save in an archive that's not going to get deleted. And so if we decide to do a drive across China or drive across Africa, which is one of my goals, I'd love to drive across Africa. Um, it's like the old Paris-Dakar rally kind of thing from the 70s and 80s. Oh, I would love to do that. Um, I know it's probably quite dangerous to do these days, but oh, that would be a dream come true. But, you know, I would have all my resource materials that I can just go back and say, oh yeah, we rem must remember that and we must remember this. Mm -hmm. And I could even put screenshots of maps. Yep. Like, you know, there's just so many things. That I could not do that in a task manager. But for the Africa trip, you would need the Porsche 959. Um, Probably, yeah. <laughs> which is unobtainable. So. I know. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. Before we geek out on time management and stuff like that, we should, we should come back to our initial uh, entry. Planning your year with a focus on innovators and creators. Mm -hmm. A new year offers uh, great opportunities for a new start, for a start of things. It's a good time to do what's uh, necessary, uh, to do something new. Many people start uh, with weight loss plans and stuff like that. And as people that want to create something new, that work on, on uh, some ideas, That's also a good place to start some this this project or whatever it is we are talking about an innovator might do. So is it a good time to start? Oh, well, any time is a good time to start. You just need to make a decision about what you actually want to change. Now, interestingly, one of my goals this year is actually a goal from last year but because of, <laughs> because of uh, I couldn't move as much. I, I didn't get the chance to do it. But one of my goals is to reduce my body fat percentage down to... 20%. Uh, I'm around about 23, 24% now, and I want to get it down to 20%. Now, the thing is, I thought, okay, we'll start on the 1st of January. But then I discovered that I have on Tuesday next week, I'm going in for a colonoscopy, part of our annual medical check. And so um, the hospital has said, you cannot eat this, you cannot eat that. And I thought, oh, this is just going to be a nightmare. I don't want to be starting a new diet, a new 
exercise program when in t- in a few days time i'm going to have to go on this weird special diet um for the hospital so i decided okay we'll wait until after i've completed the medical checkup so i'm starting my 2021 diet and exercise plan on the 13th of january not not the 1st of january so it doesn't really matter when you start you just need a date to start 1st of January is a great day, of course, it's the new year. But if you need an extra couple of weeks to put things in place and to be in the right place, then just wait a few days and then start. So for me, my fitness and diet program for 2021 begins on the on Wednesday, the 13th of January, mm-hmm. not not uh, Friday, the 1st of January. Oh, okay. Well, I think we have to tell people that you are an, like an ambitious runner. I, I love my exercise. I also love my food. <laughs> so you're sort of an outer worldly person in a way, right? You're you are already very trained. Um, let's put it that way. Yeah, and yeah, but I, it, you, it's like with anything. You, 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 there's always adapt. You're always adapting. You're always uh, evolving, and you're trying to change and try different things. And obviously, as you get older, your body is changing. So you need to be aware mm-hmm. of like certain exercises that you probably could and should do in your 20s and 30s mm-hmm. when you get to your 40s and 50s are probably not advisable yeah. um uh, so you, you know you're adapting and evolving all the time okay so um the new year is now any time is a good time to start uh, a new project uh working on a on a new business or a business idea uh, i get that uh i i like the idea of uh, for a long time i, di- I didn't really accept that you had to do a planning phase for, let's say, a year, uh, for, say, for tax purposes and stuff like that, because it seemed to, so, so random in a way. But again, it's the first of the year. It's the first day, the first week, the first whatever. It sort of has a special vibe to it. And uh, um, it's it's good to use that, that energy in a way to start something new. Um, and uh, I thought about what is the best time And what is the actual time people people use that energy? Because sometimes I see that people start in August to do some planning for the next year and, and uh, to do some strategy work. And sometimes people do that like in January for this the, the upcoming year. What do you think is a, is a, the good, best way to prepare for, for a good year? For, well, for me, it all starts in October. In October. I start brainstorming ideas in October and I give myself essentially two months to brainstorm ideas. Now, that does not mean that every single day I'm opening up my note and adding new ideas every day. But as soon as October the 1st comes, it's like as a click in my mind, okay, it's planning season. <laughs> and I start thinking about what do I want to change? What? How do I want my life to go? How am I? And I start looking at how I'm going against my current existing goals because I think one of the problems is most people's goals are too short term, and or they're too long term, and they don't have any milestones in between. What is in between for you in terms of time? Well, let's say I have a t- I I tend to plan for the decade. So my uh, and I it goes like my. Between 2009, uh, 2010 and 2020, that decade was all about health. And I I transformed my lifestyle and health and fitness. So I spent, basically, my focus for that decade was on getting my health sorted out. So when I started the decade, I didn't drink every, every day, but I drank pretty heavily on a weekend, like a lot of British people do. Uh, I was a smoker as well back in 2010. And I was probably, I think I was about 13 kilograms heavier than I am today. So I realized that I couldn't go on living my life like that. It was great. I I would never complain about it. But long term, it's not a sustainable lifestyle. So I decided, okay, the decade was about health. So This decade that we're in now, 2020 to 2030, is about, I've, I describe it as wealth. So health was my previous decade. Now it's about wealth. So what I want to do now is to, con- like to consolidate my position so that in 10 years time, I don't have to worry about retirement. So that's my goal. So but the problem is, is if I use today's numbers, so if I say I need a million dollars, let's use US dollars because it's easy one. Um in order to secure my my retirement, that might be true in 2020, but in 2029, would it be true then? Would you be able to retire on a million dollars? I prob- You probably won't be able to. 
So it's a difficult one to actually set the number. So at the moment, I've got myself of, well, I don't need to worry about the number. I need to put in place the system so that I am accumulating uh, a good, strong retirement fund. Each year is I set myself now a financial target for savings. How much am I going to save this year? So last year was X. This year is X plus Mm -hmm. 20% or whatever. Uh, And I know that way I will get to my target by 2029. So a lot of goal planning, if you do it for the year, what do you do next? Mm -hmm. So you need like a a greater purpose, a bigger picture, you know, that it's, so it's the bit in the middle that's going to give you that bigger picture. Okay. So it's like your, your long-term focus, your uh, time frame is 10 years, is your decade. You're mm-hmm. using the decade to sort of frame the whole thing. And uh, short term is a uh, the next month, let's put it that way. And you have some in-between planning, which is a year or two. This is what you consider yeah. your horizons, let's put it that way. Okay. So it's a little bit like, you know, I mean, we'll get to the uh, business projects, and but like I run my own business. So I have, uh, actually, I have said that I want my business to have a, uh, a revenue of $10 million by 2029. Now, I'm nowhere near that today. So the gap is huge. But I've got nine years to figure out how to close that gap. And that's the way I tend to, I always think that is the best way to, to develop your goals. Because if I said, okay, this year I'm going to do $10 million in revenue, it's not going to happen. Um, it would be a miracle, but I don't want to base my goals on luck. <laughs> you know, I, I know there's a process that will get me to the ultimate goal in 2029. Mm-hmm. We have to say that you have your own YouTube channel, that you uh, are very present online. Okay, so you have a like a long-term um, vision that you are working towards. It's a, like a 10-year horizon. And mm-hmm. then you, ter- you have that short term um, actions that you use your system uh, for to accomplish all these things. What is a good way for somebody that wants to, say, start a a new product or an an app or some some online service, uh, for example, that does wants to do some digital to to get into that thinking of yours? First of all, we have to kind of uh, separate out or distinguish between thinking and doing. Mm -hmm. Uh, I have a lot of clients who uh, seem to have like PhDs in thinking and they have absolutely, they've, they've been thinking about the same idea for like five or 10 years and they still haven't taken any action. And the words they're using is, I just have to. So if you ever find yourself saying, before I do that, I just have to, you're in trouble. Because just have to is not actually taking action. It's just a, a it's the kind of a, a pre-phrase for an excuse for not taking action. And when I'm when I'm doing my coaching calls and I see somebody saying, Yeah, yeah, I want to do this, but I just have to do, and I go, Oh, oh okay, okay. It's like my my ears will prick up. Here comes an excuse. And there is a need for thinking and planning, of course there is, but really you need to start throwing stuff at the wall and seeing what sticks. That's what I've found has always worked. In everything I've ever done is throw stuff at the wall and find out what sticks. So I've got people who've been telling me, I'm going to start a blog, I'm going to start a blog. And they told me this three years ago. They still haven't written a blog. Mm-hmm. They, oh, I'm looking, I'm looking for the right platform. Uh, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm looking for the right application to do the writing in. You know, none of that is important. You, <laughs> you know, every computer comes in with a built-in writing software, whether it's Microsoft Word or Apple Pages. You can write. Start writing. You don't have to publish anything yet. You can do that research on the sideline. But get writing. If that's what you want to do is write a blog, write a, you know, start writing. Um, you know, you've started a podcast. Uh, I've, I've got many clients have been talking about starting a podcast for a few years now, and I just have to find the right microphone or I just have to find the right uh, podcast software. I think, no, just start recording. You don't have to publish it. But the moment you get comfortable with a microphone in front of you and you learn how to vary your voice and make it more interesting, that's taking action. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Um, and I, I, so a lot of when you, when you're starting out a new business, it's the same thing. 
Um, you can spend years researching product development ideas, the right kind of applications to use. Um, just if you want to start an application, start doing the, the coding now. Um, cause you can alter the code later. You, you're going to be altering it anyway, cause you'll be bug fixing and doing all sorts of things. So just get started. Um, it's the same with anything. You don't have to publish immediately, but you do need to get the content or the product in some form. Mm -hmm. Um, anything else is just a distraction. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a key point that people need to realize is, there is a place for thinking, there is a place for planning, but ultimately you have nothing until you start doing something that's going to result in a blog, you know, some words written on a, in a digital format or on a piece of paper, or you've got some kind of model of the product that you want to make. Okay, so the great way to turn sort of that vision into, into a product is starting. That's, It is. that's basically before overthinking um, the best way is to do some starting. But now maybe you are working together with other people. You need some sort of alignment. Uh, it helps to do some planning also, at least to have some milestones that you set yourself uh, on a short-term basis, which is say a few weeks only or a few months, because it might be difficult to do everything at once. For example, if you do, need to do some coding, some designing, some texting and stuff like that, that needs to be coordinated. It does. But I remember when I started my YouTube channel, the original idea was to do 20 videos on YouTube. I've now done nearly 300 videos <laughs> on Todoist. So it's, the original idea was to just to do 20 videos on Todoist. This was like four years ago, five years ago. I've now done nearly 300 videos on Todoist. That was never part of the initial plan. Mm -hmm. And doing, I think I've done nearly 200 videos on Evernote You know, that was never even in the, the original idea. I never had an idea to do anything on Evernote. And I've also done probably over nearly 200 videos on productivity in general. And again, none of that was on my roadmap when I first started that YouTube channel. And uh, that's why when you do a lot of too much thinking, too much planning, you're going to miss the point. Because mm -hmm. the The, the marketplace, whatever market you're in, is changing so fast today that you might come up with the best blueprint in the world ever, but within three months, it's out of date. So this is why when you get started, you're now moving. You know, I, I remember when, when playing rugby, you know, if you, were, um, if you were a defender and you were tackling, if you were stood still, You know, the, the person running at you with the ball is just going to easily get around you. But if you're moving, you can shift and you can get that person and pull him down very, very quickly. So if once you get started, you've got momentum, you're moving, and it's so much easier to switch direction than it is to switch direction from standing start. Because when you're standing, you, you just get completely lost and overwhelmed. You need to get started. And you will find that no matter – I think it's uh, – <laughs> There's several quotes of this, but I do like Mike Tyson's quote, uh, quote that everybody has a plan when he steps in the ring or something like mm. everybody has a plan until they're punched in the yeah. face. <laughs> right. And the reality of whether you're starting a business, whether you're starting a blog or, or anything is until you get started, you know, that blueprint, when you get started, is going to get thrown out the water. But now suddenly you've got a realistic chance because you can move, you can adapt, you can change. And you can, as the, the word is, pivot very mm. quickly. You need a, a very agile approach to, to, do, to doing things. Um, but you need that, so, that horizon, like your 10-year horizon to work towards mm -hmm. to. Because mm -hmm. everything yeah. else is just walking, running, jumping, leaping, or whatever, in all sorts of directions. It is, and you, you would never get started if you, if you, I mean, that's it. That's why people don't start is because they've got too many plans. Just start. You'll find that it'll evolve and you will get much quicker at adapting to the marketplace. Mm -hmm. Okay, so it takes, takes lots of, you need to overturn that momentum to start something. Uh, that takes some time, commitment, mm -hmm. energy, um, and over time you get better but what is 
in from your point of view, um, a good place to start? Is it like when you are at 80% of what you have in mind? Is it at 20%? It's just some crabby thing you, you put out there just to test it. What, what is your, your, what do you think? Well, I, I, from, if you look at all the, the startups that have uh, been around in the, in the last few years, a lot of them have just started with a basic concept and just thrown it out there. And the feedback they get, which is one of the huge advantages we have today from what people starting a business say in the 1990s, is we can get almost instantaneous feedback today. Where we just couldn't do that in the 1990s. We had to go full on development, produce the product, and then sell the product, and then figure, oh dear, it's not selling. But now, you know, you can just throw something out there. You can even throw a concept out onto the internet, and people are going to start giving you feedback. Mm. This is why, if you want the real stuff, just get something out there, anything, um, and you'll start getting the right kind of feedback so you can alter and move. And I think it's more, it's the, isn't it the lean startup approach uh, that they call it now? Yes. Um, and I think it's a, whether you're starting a business or whether you're just wanting to start a YouTube channel, a blog, po a blog or a podcast, same principles apply. Just get something out there. You'll learn very quickly. And the beauty, as I've discovered, is if I go back to my first podcast or I go back <laughs> to my first video, I just want to cry. But then I think, wow, I've come a long way <laughs> since I started. <laughs> yeah, that's very, I, I think it's very, very cool that even uh, people that have like millions and millions of, of uh, followers uh, on their podcast, they keep their very first video podcast or whatever, because It sort of makes you humble in a way. It shows, but it shows mm. also the way that you have covered, and and I I, I really like that. And it is cringing mm. you to to listen to my first episode, but it is great to see that I have done it. So I'm I'm really proud of that. Also, I, I'm very much with you uh, with you here. A start is important, okay. Uh, a long-term uh, vision is important. Some sort of tool mm. is important. You don't need to focus on the time, actually, according to you. So it's New Year's resolutions are great. But if it's not the 1st of January, but the 13th of January is okay. And if your New Year's resolution is for August 12th, that's also okay. Well, there is, there is a reason behind that, actually, is that I'm looking at the whole year. So my, my goal is to get down to, say, body fat percentage of 20% by the end of the year. So 13 days at the beginning of the year, 12 days at the beginning of the year is not going to have a significant impact on my overall objective. And that's a key thing. I think people need to realize that you don't focus on the, the process too much because some, particularly with diet and fitness, the, the early process can be very painful. Mm -hmm. uh, but you focus on the outcome. My outcome is where I'm going to be on the 31st of December, not where I'm going to be on the 5th of January. Um, or the 12th of January or the 30th of January. That is largely irrelevant. The, those initial stages is getting the process and the habits developed. Because once they've got a process and once you've got a habit developed, I know I will achieve my goal at the end of the year. Mm -hmm. January, February, March, if you like, the first quarter is really about experimenting to figure out what's going to work. So if I, if I don't lose any weight in January or I don't drop a percentage point in January or half a percentage point, I'm not going to care. Because it just means I need to adapt. I need to change something. I need to do something to, to make it work. My objective is what I'm, where I'm going to be on the 31st of December, not where I'm going to be on the 30th of January or the 28th of February. That, that's irrelevant. Mm -hmm. The objective is where I'm going to be on the 31st of December 2021. That's what counts. Mm -hmm. And I think Tony Robbins, or probably Jim Rohn said it best, I think, when he said that most people overestimate what they can accomplish in a year and underestimate what they can accomplish in a decade. And that really stuck with me. And now I know. So the, why am I doing health and fitness? Because in 10 years time, I'll be 60. <laughs> and I won't, I don't intend to retire, but I don't want to spend my old age, if you can describe 60 as being old, I don't think it is these days. But I don't want to, I, I don't want to spend, you know, my like, twilight years, as we call it, with ill health, 
I want to still have the energy, the vitality to be able to climb mountains, to drive across Africa in an old Land Rover. So it's going to break down because they always do. Yeah. <laughs> and so I'm going to be in and out of the car. I'm going to, there's going to, it's going to be an adventure. You know, I want to have that physical health and vitality to be able to do that. Mm-hmm. That's why my fitness goal this year is related to that overall uh vision if you like the overall purpose which is i want to have as adventurous and energetic uh life as i possibly can to do something like that you need to change something change a habit or in, in, uh, start a habit that takes time it takes extra time and mm-hmm. that's oftentimes the problem why people don't do things because they think They don't have the time, or they say they don't have the time, or they might not have the time. How do you carve out time off a busy schedule to do changes? That's a, that's a really good one, actually, because for me, that comes down to where your priorities lie. Um, one of the things that um, one of the people I, I really admire is Dwayne The Rock Johnson. And his mindset about his exercise schedule, for example, is no matter what exercise is what he does. That is who he is. And he will sacrifice sleep. He will sacrifice social time in order to go to the gym. So if he's got a day on set where he's got to be on set at 7 a.m. in the morning and he knows he won't be finishing until 10 p.m., He's going to wake up at 3 a.m. and start exercising at 4 a.m. Because for him, his exercise is a must. He will find the time to do it. And now he's an extreme case. But for me, I, I have a very, very busy schedule. I have lots of calls, meetings, and I've got lots of content to create every day. But I will not sacrifice between 2 p.m. and 3 p.m. in the afternoon because that's my exercise time even if it's just going out for a walk because I need, for me, it's the break in the day. because I start work at about 7 AM and I'm finishing at usually 11 PM. I need that break. So I choose rather than sitting on the sofa, watching TV, my choice is to get some exercise in. Um, but we have choices and we, it's up to us how we do it. So for me, it's a priority. That's where it comes in. So you've got to find that time and it's got to become a priority. So whether you wake up a bit earlier or whether you delay your dinner time or whether you say, right, lunch times, I'm going out for 30 minutes. I'm just going to do some exercise. You have to pick and choose. But whatever your goals are, if it's writing a blog post, you know, you've got to find that hour to write that post. You allow your priorities to actually be priorities and not just be something that is on your to-do list or on your whiteboard or whatever. Yeah, I mean, I've always felt that if it's important enough, you'll find the time. Mm-hmm. And then you can focus on uh, it and don't start to procrastinate about it. I mean, one of the things that I found was there are times like most people who exercise regularly, they'll tell you <laughs> that you go through troughs and peaks. So there are times when exercise is just so easy and it's and you look forward to it. And then there's days where you do, you know, it's just a, it's a real pain, but you have to do it. And whenever I go into a trough, I always say, right, it's time for a 30-day challenge. <laughs> and 30-day challenges are brilliant because once you get past day seven, you are not going to stop. <laughs> You're going to keep going no matter what. So even if it's like writing, you know, you decide that, okay, my goal this year is to start a blog. I would tell somebody, right, your first 30-day month is April this year. So you've got three months in which to do as much planning and thinking and procrastinating as you want. But on April the 1st, you write your first blog post. April the 2nd, you write your second and keep it going for 30 days. At the end of the month, you've got 30 blog posts. Now, it doesn't mean you publish them. Uh, and it may be that you decide that I'm going to spend an hour every day doing something on my blog. So day one, you write. Day two, you you edit. Day three, you write. Day four, you edit. So on the odd days, you're writing a thousand words. On the even days, you're editing. Uh, you choose how you do it. But you do that for 30 days. And at the end of the month, you've either got 15 well-written blog posts or 30. Depends on how you do it. 
but it means that you've done something action orientated at the for 30 days. It's brilliant. And that 30 day challenge is once you get past day seven, you don't stop. <laughs> um, <laughs> there's no way you will stop because you don't, you know, that once you, f once you stop, even for one day, you go back to zero. Mm. I like that 30 day uh, challenge idea. Uh, you're probably aware of NaNoWriMo, that writing challenge. Uh, which is like mm -hmm. in October every year and November, November, November. right? It's no, it's Movember. It's not Movember. It's a, a NaNoWriMo November. month, and uh, <laughs> yeah. and it's a it's a really really great challenge. It's start your own your first novel or write something with at least 50,000 words in the month of November. And you get a lot of support by local groups, by uh, international groups, uh, via the internet. Uh, and everybody is sort of uh, in that world, in that writing world, is focused on NaNoWriMo. And it's hundreds of thousands of people working on on their first mm -hmm. novel or on a piece of uh, whatever they they love to, to write about. Mm. Oh, it's brilliant. I tell you, 30 day challenges are just amazing. And you get four of them. If you do it by a month with 30 days, you've got four each year. And it's just fantastic. And if I remember, it's April, June. <laughs> I've got to try and remember <laughs> these. Um, I think it's September and it's, I think it's, um, is it November as well? November. It's something like that. Those are your four 30-day months. So I don't waste those opportunities. They're just brilliant. Day one is the first of, say, first of April. And then on 30th of April, it finishes. And it's like, first of May is like, yes. yes. It's such a great feeling. <laughs> you have done something and you're relieved to have it not on your back anymore. Uh, and you've got those crosses on your calendar. It's great. Okay. <laughs> so w one month, 30 days, it's kind of easy to plan and to predict and to sort of move forward uh, because you're driven. You can see a um, imagine, envision a possible result. Um, it is mm -hmm. easy sort of to, to think of a one month period, but actually it is impossible to predict the future uh, in general. So, but we still want to do some, at least envisioning of where we want to be in 10 years. Um, mm -hmm. So there's lots of foresight possibilities. There's uh, um, lots of methods to work with. Um, and we always have like a best case, a standard or normal case and the worst case and stuff like that, that we work with. Um, but nobody had, as a very, very worst case, uh, something like COVID. Um, so we had to adapt quickly to something like that. But my question is, is why do something like a long-term view, your decade, when you even can't imagine and envision the future? Well, the thing is, you, you're not going to be able to predict the exact future. I don't think anyone can do that. We're not fortune tellers. But one of the things that I've advised a few of my students recently uh, here in Korea is uh, this weekend, I, I go to the Korean blogs, websites, and look for professors and business thought leaders, find their predictions for 2021. And because these guys... Like for me, I'm in the thick of it. Every single day I'm writing content based on what I'm seeing in the real world. I don't really have a lot of time to kind of put my head up and say, where are we going? <laughs> you know, I, I'm there. And like most people are in the thick of it. We don't have a lot of time to put our heads up and go, wait a minute, where's the world going? But there are people who do that for a living. They're, this is their job and these and they write blog posts at the end, December, January time. They're writing blog posts and articles, and you can find them. And these are professors and business thought leaders and even philosophers who are saying, right, these are the trends. They're seeing the data that we don't see. And like I hear, for example, there was articles in the newspaper back in November about <laughs> the newspapers described a mass exodus out of California. Because everyone's working from home now, they don't have to live in San Francisco Bay Area and pay mm. all that huge rental fee and the Californian tax, which is incredibly high. They can move out to a low tax state and work from home. 
But when you talk to Californians, they say, yeah, it's not that many people. Mm. <laughs> but the media are really blowing up. But you see, I don't have accurate data. I don't know how many people have left New California and moved in. But there are people out there whose job it is to analyze that data, and they're writing about it. They're writing articles. So you can find out what's going on in the world uh, from a bigger perspective, and you can see the trends. You know, five years ago, I remember reading an article saying the next big thing in business technology will be video conferencing. <laughs> this was five years mm-hmm. ago. And say by 2020, and I think this guy must have been very lucky, <laughs> by 2020, you know, most business meetings will be done by a video call. Mm-hmm. Well, he was probably wrong for four and a half years. But then COVID came along, and now the vast majority of business meetings are done via Microsoft Teams or Zoom. Mm-hmm. So, you know, and as I was saying to my, my, my students this morning, do you really think after two years, because it's going to take two years probably for, the, for this pandemic to disappear mm-hmm. completely, uh, do you think after two years, businesses are going to go backwards to 2019? Yeah, I don't think so. Yep. Um, you know, two years is a long time today in terms of technology, technological advancement. Uh, working from home is here to stay. It's not going to be like you have to work from home, but I can't see people having to go to an office and be chained to a desk, you know, nine till five, Monday to Friday uh, after this year. It's just not going to happen. So those are things that we can predict already, but there are people out there and it doesn't take a, a big Google search to find the predictions, and some of them will be true, some of them will be will be inaccurate, and you can take a you know your own opinion based on reading a few of these articles. But for me, the big change I think coming just from what I've been reading is the uh, events. So we have all these big conferences around the world. The Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas, obviously not this year, yep. probably not next year. Is that going to change? How is it going to change? These events are going to be the next thing to have a big change, and a lot of it will go online. And you know, Zoom is not suddenly going to sit back, put their feet up on the table and say, we've done it. They're going to continue innovating. We're going to get more and better and better tools to do our video calls Uh, There are already psychologists who are looking at how can we make it even more meaningful and interactive. Uh, Tony Robbins this year did an amazing thing with his UPW's Unleashed Power Within course. You know, that was where 10 to 20,000 people met up in a big stadium. And suddenly in March, he had to cancel them all. By June, He'd built, he'd spent $10 million on a huge studio to put it on as a virtual event. And I did the first one back in July and it was unbelievable. I've done a live event and I've done the virtual event and it wasn't quite the same, the energy, but the energy was there. And that just blew me away. I thought, wow, if they can do that in first attempt, where is that going to be in two or three years time? Yeah. yeah. So I, I know that is an area that's going to change in the next three or four years. And you can do this with almost any industry. You can look at where we are today and where the trends are going. And you can read the professors and the business leaders, and they will you know, give you a good indication of where things are going. Mm. It is not that difficult to um, get to at least some basic information about trends. And uh, mm-hmm. Google is always your friend. Uh, I'm it is. <laughs> as a consultant, I, I offer like a, a trend monitoring uh, tool uh, concept, which helps uh, uh, businesses to do something like that on on their own a bit more methodically. Uh, so you can use that in an innovation process. And I think it is really important to, in that case, to uh, to be open for errors. Nobody mm-hmm. knows the truth of the future nobody knows how it's turning going to turn out but so it's not an error to do something wrong here or to do a wrong prediction in parentheses but it's the the error is is not looking into it at all Mm -hmm. oh okay yeah wow you need an idea you need an idea of where it's going yeah Uh, yeah, right Mm -hmm. okay cool um we have talked about uh some some very very basic basis concepts of of uh of uh, approaching uh, something new it's not according to you not 
are connected to the new year necessarily, but it might help to, to start something with the new year. But then it's also helpful to have some tools uh, that can help to, to do all these things. Um, I see that you lean a lot towards Apple apps right now. Many people have iPhones, iPads and stuff like that. Um, what are your tools and tips uh, that, you are, that, you, that help you uh, for following through and planning things? For knowledge storage well, for also. Me, for me, it's still Evernote. I, I had a problem with the new Evernote when it came out in September, October time. Um, it broke all, <laughs> the new <laughs> the new Evernote broke all my workflows. Ah, terrible. And um, it took me actually in the end. I said, right, I need to sit down, and I ended up spending a whole day uh, reorganizing it so that the, my workflows were working again. Uh, and so and. Over the last three or four months, to be to be you know credit to Evernote that it has got better and better, yep. and it, it's now it's certainly in a place now that I can use it just as be- actually in many ways, particularly from a, a UI point of view, I actually prefer the new Evernote. Yes, me too. Uh, there's still some back there's still some back end stuff that needs sorting out, but I'm willing to wait for that. There's no problem because everything's working. So Evernote is kind of the first app I open up every day because that's where my project notes are. Mm-hmm. Uh, that's pretty much where, you know, all that stuff is. And my task list manager of choice is Todoist and has been for many, many years. I, I just love the simplicity of it, but it's also powerful enough in order to take a lot of stuff. And so I, I've in the past, I've, ex- <laughs> I've had complex applications that have left me feeling overwhelmed and they've been productivity uh, what i would say is procrastinators heaven because there's so many bells and whistles to play with that i spend more time playing with those instead of doing the work mm-hmm. so uh i needed to get away from that several years ago so i did so those are my go-to apps but as you mentioned, I, I'm very much in the Apple ecosystem. So all my cloud storage is in iCloud, all my documents. And I use pages, numbers, and Keynote for you know the, the actual um, word processing and that kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. So, but that's it really. Um, Ulysses, I'd say, is my writing tool. Uh, it's a simple app again, but it's it just works. And it's... It, again, it, the simplicity of it allows me to be able to just get on and write. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I made a, a short challenge for myself to put everything I can into Evernote. So I, I don't even write at any other place than Evernote because it is creating some content that I can uh, refer to later on. Uh, even if I don't use it right away, it's sort of uh, some research material that I can use for future projects, which is lost if I s- start writing uh, about things in, in Ulysses, for example, or in, in other tools. So, I, um, But it's not the, the best tool to write creatively all the time, I, I think. You store basically your knowledge in Evernote. You use that. Um, you use Todoist. And what I like about Todoist is it's a perfect tool for your individual tasks but it has uh, introduced they have introduced i think the kanban boards also a while ago which basically helps you to visualize what you need to do um, and it helps you to cooperate with others also using Todoist, which I think is a really big thing because Trello, for example, doesn't really help me do things, I think. That's rather the Todoist thing, but it helps me communicate with others a lot. It's a very good tool for that. Uh, so pick, Todoist picking up that Kanban style and sharing uh, a task and stuff like that with others in a team, in a small team, is a very good solution for people or for companies that don't even have a system in place like that that start with say digital tasks and 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 um, boards and stuff like that an agile approach I think um, sometimes it's very difficult to introduce a big system but it's very simple to do something on a personal level in a company yeah it can be very difficult I mean I've worked with a couple of companies where we've rolled out to do it as for teams but I find that when you roll it out to a company with like 100 or 250 um, employees, it's a big, big project. But if you're doing it to a small team of like five to 12 people, it actually works very well and very quickly. Carl, do you have a, like a special tip or a tool uh, or uh, the way you approach your 
starting a 30-day challenge? For, well, the 30-day challenge for me is you need you need to make sure you're planning ahead for it. And also, the biggest tip is before you set the the start date, look through your calendar. Like I said, I, I have them in the, I, I got a big medical checkup, my annual checkup coming up on uh, next week. You know, if I was doing a 30 day exercise challenge this month, and then suddenly it gets to Tuesday next week, and I spend all day in the health clinic being checked out and things stuck down my throat and stuff like that, mm -hmm. you know, it's not going to happen. So you got to be very clear about your calendar first. So It's like if you're going to do a 30-day challenge in August and you've got two-week vacation and you're looking forward to sitting by the pool, drinking beer and uh, reading books, that's not a good time to do a 30-day exercise challenge. But it might be a good idea to do a 30-day reading challenge. Mm -hmm. You know, there's lots of things you can do in a 30-day challenge. You can give up alcohol if you're a drinker. You can give up um, you know, sugar. Uh, there's there's so many things. You can read books. You can, as I said, write something every day for 30 days, write a journal. And so there's multiple things you could do in a 30-day challenge, but you do need to make sure that your calendar is not going to throw something up that throws you out. Uh, you know, if I was traveling to Europe uh, by aeroplane, you know, from here to, to say the UK, if you include leaving home time, driving to the airport, checking in, catching the flight, the transfer Amsterdam to the UK, it's, we're talking 18, 19 hours of traveling. You know, where am I going to do my exercise? Mm, yeah. <laughs> so you've got to be looking at your calendar before you set out on a 30 day challenge and make sure you've had to got 30 days where there isn't going to be a major disruption in your schedule. Mm -hmm. Do you have like a, a, a checklist or do you use like a checklist to start something like that that says, okay, my goal is it's, I mean, you have to say, you have to write down possibly your goal. Uh, and or do you need anything else to start like that and to keep you working on it? Yeah, you need to set a minimum mm -hmm. because uh, I did a last uh, November, I did a 30 day exercise uh, exercise challenge, uh, 30 days of exercise. Now that was it, 30 days of exercise. So that could be running, it could be circuit training, it could be going to the gym, but I need to set a minimum. So my minimum was uh, 20 minutes intentional exercise. So 20 minutes running or 20 minutes um, uh, circuit training or if it was one of those days where I just don't have time, I have a backup, which is 30 minute in brisk walk. Mm -hmm. Because I know that even if it's 1130 at night, I can walk down the street for 15 minutes, turn around and walk back again. Yeah. That's me. That counts. So you need to set those parameters before the month starts. What's your minimum mm -hmm. requirement? Because you are going to have days when you're tired. We're human beings. We're not machines. So there's going to be days when you're tired. There's going to be an emergency that's going to throw you out. So what's your minimum? Uh, you know, if you're journaling, like your minimum might be, okay, I need to write a minimum of 100 words. Now, hopefully you're writing 500 words or more when you're journaling. But there are going to be days when you're just really not in the mood or you just don't have time. So what's the minimum? Set that minimum for you to achieve that check mark. And I would always recommend also is either using a digital tool where you can see your progress or even better, print off a 30-day calendar and stick it on the wall. And every day when you've done your challenge, use a red marker or something and cross it off because seeing it like that and you get to day 15 and you've not missed a day, you, you're not going to fail. You're going to keep going. Mm. So using something very, very simple, very basic is helping succeeding uh, in getting to the result. You don't need fancy mm -hmm. tools. Absolutely. It's at least something Basics, um, a piece of paper, one piece of paper, not 20 pieces of paper. Mm -hmm. Okay. No. Mm -hmm. Cool. Mm -hmm. Cool. Yeah. Carl, do you, do you recommend any resources for the things we talked about? Like, uh, is there, we talked about to do is an Evernote uh, for task and, and, and uh, project management, knowledge management, stuff like that. We talked about 
the paper, the single sheet of paper that you might print out and put it on your wall, a big marker, stuff like that. The one sentence of the thing that you want to achieve in your 30-day challenge. We talked about the 30-day challenge. Is there anything, any other resources that you recommend, like uh, courses or something else, uh, some videos, a YouTube channel that you would prefer? Well, if you're interested in doing the 30-day challenge, I would recommend having a look at Matt Develia's 30-day uh, challenge playlist on YouTube. Uh, Matt Develia is a great filmmaker. Uh, he's done some amazing YouTube channel uh, videos on productivity and minimalism, which is his theme. Uh, and he did, I think it was a year ago, two years ago. Uh, yeah, about a year ago, he set about, actually it's two years ago now, he set about doing 30-day challenge every month. And he described the process and what he was doing. So that will give you a really good idea about what you can do, some really good ideas for 30-day challenges. And there's, you know, I, obviously I've got a load of stuff on my YouTube channel on Todoist, if anyone's interested in Todoist. Uh, I recently, just a few months ago, updated the beginner's guide there. So there's 10 videos on how to get started with Todoist. And for for notes apps that's a difficult one because there's an awful lot of new notes apps in the market right now and i would recommend just having a look around um francesco delesso's channel is very good for seeing different various notes apps and he does a pretty good overview of what each note app is trying to do so and of course there's uh, steve dotto if you want to learn anything to do with tech, go to Steve Dotto's channel, Dotto Tech, um, because Steve has just got this wonderful personality and he explains things in a way that I think most people will understand. Well, thank you, Carl. I think that is very helpful. I really like the 30-day challenge approach that will, uh, combined with that 10-year planning horizon um, that gives a lot of room, that leaves a lot of room. Um, I, I especially enjoyed that you said that you have to focus on your priorities if you to get things done. You have to make time and uh, you don't have to spend time on stuff that is not your priority. That, that's a lot of it is really understanding where your priorities are and what you really want to accomplish. But remember, this is not, it's not a sprint. It's really all about where do you want to be on the 31st of December, 2021, in terms of your lifestyle, in terms of your business goals, your creative goals, and anything that you want to achieve. Set the process up, make sure you're doing it frequently, use a to-do list manager, whatever you want to use to make sure you're doing it, 30-day challenges to get you started. But focus on the outcome. Where do you want to be on the 31st of December, 2021? Because you're going to have good days and you're going to have bad days. And as long as you remember that the occasional bad day is not a problem. Yeah. But if you, if you get to February and you think, I've really had a bad start to the year, I give up. It means you're not focusing on where you want to be on the 31st of December. You could have a terrible January and February, but you could pick it up on the 1st of March and you can still achieve your goal by the 31st of December, 2021. That's what matters, not where you are on the 28th of February. Thank you, Carl. Have a great 2021. I will. You're welcome. Thank you very much for having me. What a great way to start a new year, recording a new episode for the podcast. That was my conversation with productivity coach Carl Pullin. I hope this conversation was helpful for you to do your planning, your envisioning what you're going to do in 2021 and in this next decade. My name is Klaus. I'm an innovation coach. The podcast is recorded in Baden-Württemberg in the southwest of Germany. This is the 2.5 Conversations Connecting Innovators. Have a great year.